Save on O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner. Get two cans of O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner for just $8. Valid in-store only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to the Archaeology Show. TAS goes behind the headlines to bring you the real stories about archaeology and the history around us. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Show, episode 118. On today's show, we talk about our recent visit to Chichen Itza. Let's dig a little deeper. All right, welcome to the Archaeology Show. How's it going? Good, good, good. So we got to preface this by saying we're in a different recording location. Uh, as longtime listeners know, we live in an RV, and we're currently in Pennsylvania as we're recording this, and I'm meeting with a client in philadelphia so we decided to instead of just come out here which is about an hour and a half drive from where we're parked with our rv instead of just coming out here for the morning and meeting with this client on a friday we would come and just spend uh the day friday and saturday uh, you know exploring the history and and the sites of philadelphia so maybe we'll have that to talk about on a next on a future episode yeah that would be be awesome because i didn't really know a whole lot about this area and i am excited to learn and explore it yeah yeah so we're in a hotel room kind of airbnb thing if you don't know about sonder check it out they seem to have some pretty cool yeah like places it's but like, anyway it's like a little apartment yeah it's cute and small yeah and we had a we had a smaller one actually that probably wouldn't be so echoey with hardwood floors actually booked but two hours before we got here they called and said the previous occupant utterly destroyed the room <laughs> I like, I'm like, what does that mean <laughs> like yeah. what is utterly they must have had a party and oh. just like broke furniture and stuff or something yeah, they did something and clearly the cleaning staff didn't get there in time to like yeah. take care of it so yeah. they said we're moving you and they moved us to a one bedroom down yeah. the street so a much more expensive place for the mm-hmm. same price so i'm like yes please yeah sounds uh, good to us but there's like construction outside yeah and there's all kinds of things going. i mean we're in a city so you're gonna hear some noise yeah and we're i'm gonna try to cut some of this reverb out but it is what it is yeah so. yeah that's gonna be kind of the name of the game with us is that we will yeah. be recording in different places all the time and that's just right it's that's better just than our, our lifestyle right better now better than our last recording on that gopro with oh, the wind yeah and that the, was Cancun. really bad yeah. <laughs> so anyway this is this is top notch compared to that if i'd remembered my microphones in mexico in Cancun, that would have been better been fine, so yeah. Speaking of, yes, we were in Mexico a couple of weeks ago. We were. Yeah. And we mentioned we'd be doing a Chichen Itza episode. And I think we talked about on that show why we felt relatively OK going to Mexico during a pandemic or yeah. the, the later throes of a pandemic, depending yeah. on where you're sitting on this. And also the reason we feel OK being here in Philadelphia is we are both vaccinated. Number one, we were able to get in on some overflow vaccines that were going to be thrown away. Because neither of us technically, qual- well, we do qualify now, but at the time we didn't. So yeah. anyway, we, we got in on an overflow vaccine situation and we got vaccined. Vaccinated. <laughs> vaccinated. <laughs> I am smart. S-M-R-T. <laughs> anyway, so we're both vaccinated and we've both been very good about just staying away from people. We did it in Mexico. We kept our masks on the whole time we were there, even though other people were not doing that, with the exception of when we were in the water. And yeah, we just made a, a an effort to stay yeah. isolated as well as we could. So I think we've yeah. been doing a pretty good job and we're doing the same thing here in Philadelphia as well. Yeah. I mentioned meeting with a client, but all of their people, because it's a, it's a, well, it's a public institution. They're all vaccinated. Yeah. And oh, and you have to get a rapid test too when you arrive, don't you? I have, a, I have to get a test coming yeah. in the door that yeah. they'll have the results for in 15 minutes. So that's kind of that's kind of crazy. Yeah, but it yeah. it you know it's good. It's yeah, it's all of pr- us do. keeping everybody protected, and it's just another one of the things that makes us feel like right. we're we're okay, and hopefully not contributing to the furthering of the pandemic because I think we're relatively safe right now. So, right. Yeah. So let's talk about the Maya. Yeah, let's do that. So this whole episode is prompted by our time in Mexico, of course, and when. We were going there. We knew we wanted to leave the resort and do some archaeology stuff. <laughs> in pre-pandemic times, we had bigger plans of like meeting up with some 
people that you knew through somebody else who could mm-hmm. get us like, you know, a almost like a special tour of the of the area, right? Right, right. But then, you know, pandemic happened, we had to cancel our plans, and this time around we just knew we wouldn't be able to coordinate that. So yeah. we just sort of booked a tour through our resort and just sort of went with it because we're like, well, we'll see some ruins, we'll see the temples. And that's really the best we can hope for, right? Yeah, and there were other tours available. In fact, we were closer to Tulum, which yeah. is a, a big Mayan ruins right like right on the sea, yeah. which would have been really cool. But, you know, if you've only got a limited amount of time and if we'd have done everything, these, I mean, sure, we'd paid for our all-inclusive resort thing a, a long time ago. So that was, that was like already done. Mm-hmm. But all these extra little things cost a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> it's not they, cheap to do these tours. They do. They do. I think what yeah. we paid like maybe 200 bucks total for this Chichen Itza tour yeah, round trip. And that like was like that. a full day thing. We'll get into that a little bit more in the next segment because yeah. what we wanted to do. Well, what <laughs> here's what we should have done before we went to yeah. Chichen Itza. We should have done a little bit of research to figure out exactly what we were going to see and just get a better idea of the people that built it and what the civilization was like there because that I felt was very much missing from the tour. Mm-hmm. You know, they talked about the Mayan calendar and how it was supposed to end in 2012. And they talked about the serpent on the steps that happens because of the shadow across the pyramid and, you know, all the the things that it is technically famous for, but it's not really the like archaeology and civilization focused things. And I feel like we missed that a little bit on the tour. I feel like the stuff that we learned are the things that are contained in like the base knowledge that most archaeologists have of Chichen Itza. Yeah. Whether you remember it or not, we all learned about Chichen Itza at some point during our education. Right. And not necessarily your like high school education, but definitely an undergraduate education. Mm -hmm. It was always in like an an anthropology 101 class. And, you know, Rachel and I came through uh, undergrad at basically the same time, separated by like 10 years in age. But, uh, you know, I went into the Navy first and served my country, whatever. Navy D. Anyway, so. <laughs> oh, privileged white girl over here. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so so we did. Uh, we basically were in college at the beginning of the, the 2000s, you know, kind of at the same time yeah. in different places. And that's also when Jared Diamond's book came out called, uh, was it just called Collapse? He had a book called Collapse because it was right after Guns, Germs, and Steel, okay. which was huge. And Collapse came out like right after that. And I actually was in a little reading group in college that talked about Collapse. And I don't know if you ever read that, but Mm-mm. a lot of people were reading that. And it was polarizing because the Maya were in there as the Maya, Easter Island. Um, I think Rome was in there. Mm-hmm. But it was the collapse of civilizations. What causes it? What happens? And of course, the the initial blowback was... Well, I mean, there's still Maya that live there. Yeah. Like our guide was Mayan. Yeah. <laughs> According to him. Yeah. You know, he's a descendant. He's, I mean, there's current Mayan people. We went to a Mayan village. Yeah. And, yeah. and bought things from them. There's thousands of Mayan people that right. still live in the area. And they still lived in that area when the Spanish conquistador showed up. So like. Right. Yes, the city doesn't exist as it did, you know, a thousand years ago anymore. But that doesn't mean the people are gone. Yeah, I mean, because they're not living in big stone, t- uh, you know, around big stone temples and mm-hmm. doing that and beheading people every Sunday, does that mean <laughs> that they collapsed? <laughs> eh, they just changed what they're doing. Yeah. Well, you know? I firmly believe we need to take back the word collapse mm-hmm. because right. you can still talk about a city collapsing and no longer being the same center of power that it was without indicating that the people also disappeared. I mean, let's talk about the collapse of Tonopah, Nevada. That's something nobody <laughs> wants know. to talk about. There's still people there. Listen, the silver the city industry itself. <laughs> in Tonopah, Nevada in 1905 was raging. And yeah. then it collapsed. How about Virginia City? That's an even better example. The collapse of Virginia City. Now it's yeah. just a, it's a tour spot just yeah. like Chichen Itza. Sure, there's like thousands of people there. And there's probably people there that have lived there oh their whole God. lives. But I'm so going to write a book anyway. about the collapse of Tonopah. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely should. All right, so moving on. So here's what we should have done before we went to Chichen Itza. And anybody who has plans on going to see it, and if they're doing it as part of a resort tour, I would recommend doing a little bit of research ahead of time just so that you know who the Maya are and why they were in Chichen Itza specifically. Mm -hmm. So starting with who they are and where they are, they sort of spread across southeastern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and then the western parts of Honduras and El Salvador. So really large area that they occupied And 
most of the major part of their society was was in the Guatemala area. That seems to be where the major complex civilizations were. Mm-hmm. With Chichen Itza excluded, of course, because that's Mexico. But Yeah, and that is one thing that our guide said about Chichen Itza was that it was more of a, a mixture of yeah. societies that came there and used that as a religious and temple space. So yeah, yeah, and we'll talk about that in the next segment more. That was one thing that he didn't get entirely wrong. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> but this this yeah. massive spread across all these different regions with these probably smaller tribes and things like that is one thing that probably contributed to that. Yeah, for sure. So Mayan civilization is broken up into really annoying archaeology terms like they always are. (laughs) So we start with the pre-classic period. I feel like, (laughs) what was it? It was some sitcom or something where somebody was making fun of terms like that. I feel like everything is like, all right, we're going to talk about the proto-pre-post-classic period now. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like, come on, do better. But anyway, so the pre-classic period dates from about 2000 BCE to 250 CE. It's a large time period, and it's when these large complex societies just, they they began building them. They started doing things like cultivating the staple crops like maize, beans, squash varieties, chili peppers. Those All those things started to happen, and it's what allowed these complex societies to develop. Yeah, and let's let's talk about uh, BCE and CE real quick. Yeah. Because I don't know if we ever have. BCE stands for Before the Common Era, and CE stands for Common Era, and it was probably developed in order to basically take Jesus out of it. Yeah, like because, to de-Christianified dating. Yeah, because BC, pre this, is before Christ, yeah. and AD is Anno Domini, uh, after death. Yeah. So, so, they, so they say BCE and CE, and yet still base it on Christ. I know, we really should just be doing... BP. Yeah, before present. Yeah, most archaeologists and scientists that are doing anything date related, when they put dates in papers, it's BP. This they'll say Cal BP usually, which is calibrated. Um, uh, you know, before present calibrated or calibrated years or calibrated, you know, whatever it is. And calibrated mm-hmm. means it was you've got some sort of date that was calibrated against something else. Okay. You know, like carbon fourteen dating is often calibrated against tree ring dating or mm. some other sort of dating method. So gotcha. it's so it's placed in time. So but B C E and C E are what's in a lot of the literature. So just know that before common era is before two thousand, C E is I mean before zero mm-hmm. and after uh C E is after zero. But if yeah. you ever hear B P, it's literally before present. Also yeah. Interestingly, carbon-14 dates, when you hear BP, it typically refers to before like the 1950s. Oh. Because the 1950s, 40s and 50s is when we did a lot of nuclear testing. Mm -hmm. And it actually blew the carbon-14 ratio out of whack for everything going forward. Oh, I had no idea. (laughs) Okay, well, there you go. So anybody trying to do carbon-14 dating like a thousand years from now for this time period Mm -hmm. is not going to be very successful. (laughs) So, but anything, sorry, future archaeologists. <laughs> I know anything before that has its ratio locked in typically in the in the carbon deposits, mm-hmm. and you can you can measure that ratio. But anything after that has an inflated amount in it that's unnatural. Hmm. Gotcha. So, yeah. All, All right. right. Well, yeah. moving forward, yeah, that's your definition of the the times and how that works. Um. So in this pre-classic period, the large cities began to emerge by about 500 BCE. And those, these are the cities that had monumental architecture. They're large, complex, probably dynasty type of mm-hmm. societies. And they were mostly in the Guatemala highlands. So this developed into what is called the classic period. And that begins in 250 CE. And the reasons I saw for starting this period at that time is because it's when they started using the Maya long count calendar. And what I mean by long count calendar is that they they identified a date in the past, like I, th- I think it was like 3,000 years ago or something like that. And they started counting time based on that specific date. And you know how the, the I, well, actually, I don't really know exactly how the Mayan calendar works, but it is how they counted time and they based everything in their lives around this this calendar. Yeah, I'd like to bring in an expert on the Mayan calendar because... The long count, I believe, is is loose based loosely based on and I don't know how the Maya ever would have known this, but loosely based on like the solar system's trip around the galaxy. It is, yeah. 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 Not necessarily exactly, and I think it's more than three thousand years. It's like twenty five thousand years or something like that. Oh, it maybe. Yeah. I didn't really look into it right, too right. in detail, but yeah. But it it's almost like this calendar 
I mean, they have uh, an enormous number of gods, of course, um, like a lot of societies around this time did. But it almost seems like the calendar became like their their real their guiding religion. Mm-hmm. You know, everything was just built around it, and yeah. and you know everything just was based around the calendar. So. All the structures, all the temples, everything. It, yeah, it had some significance with the calendar as you know as the inspiration for what they were doing. So yeah, it was very like, very important to them as a as a society. Yeah, I feel like if you went back there and talked to us, because the 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 probably the Mayan priests and stuff were the ones that were really involved with all that. And mm-hmm. uh, I feel like if you went back as a mathematician and just said, <laughs> sat them down and showed them like algebra, they'd be just like amazed. Oh yeah, probably. If, they probably already got things like algebra. They just called it something they different. They probably did. Yeah. And they <laughs> yeah. probably would have developed it on their own given enough time. Yeah. Yeah. If they hadn't collapsed. It, oh, well. oh, look, there's that word again. <laughs> <laughs> Mayan people are gone. It just no, shows, they're not. It just goes to show you, if you don't learn algebra, you will collapse. <laughs> oh my God. So, so moving on. <laughs> There were a bunch of these different city states that had monumental architecture and they were based on this calendar and they were all linked by like really complex trade systems across Guatemala and then Belize and into the other countries I mentioned. And uh, they were definitely dynastic societies that had one single le- that had one single leader. And then by the 800s, this time period is coming to a close and it's partly because there was a rise of like a rich upper class from all this trading that they were doing. And they started sort of eroding the power of the one single King that had been ruling the, whatever society it was. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple in particular that were like the major cities in Guatemala. I, their names are escaping me right now, but they both just sort of that power started to diversify and it wasn't, wasn't with one person in one family and they just sort of like lost power and eventually the cities themselves just kind of broke down and all the people that were there didn't go anywhere. They did not collapse <laughs> along with the city. <laughs> they moved north, it seems like. And that's how we ended up seeing the rise of Chichen Itza in the northern part, in the post-classic part, if you will. <laughs> it's the post-new proto-classic <laughs> something or other. The post-classic era, which begins around the 800s and... Chichen Itza is the sort of center of power of that time period. And it's these people who were in the, in Guatemala and they sort of started moving North and and creating this power. And it's why you see such a diverse population and diverse types of architecture in Chichen Itza is because it's a bunch of people sort of coming into this area together, like migrating there together. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And the Maya were still there when the conquistador showed up. There's a city called Nojpeten. Spell it. N O J P E T E N. I'm not going to try to pronounce a Mayan word. Yeah, I can't do that. But it was the last, you know, uncolonized Mayan city, and it didn't, it didn't fall. Is not quite the right word, obviously, because the Mayan people are still around. But the Spanish didn't sort of get them in line, if you mm. will, until the end of the 1600s. So you know, Mayans were there for a long time, and yeah. they're still there. So. All right. Well, with that, we'll talk about our visit to Chichen Itza on the other side of the break. Back in a minute. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30 percent off your first three months or go to z-e-n-c-a-s-t-r dot com and use the code t-a-s introducing zaxby's new chicken finger tacos one with pico and creamy chipotle ranch and the other with bacon and avocado ranch chicken experts since 1990 taco experts since now woo saucy zaxby's people are driven by the search for better but when it comes to hiring the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. The hiring process can be slow and overwhelming. Simplify hiring with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. 
Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. That's Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back to the Archaeology Show, episode 118. And we are talking about the Maya civilization and our visit to Chichen Itza, one of the most well-known Mayan, I don't know, sites, mm-hmm. architecture, things. It's, I mean, it's temples. on temples. It's yeah. on calendars and mouse pads. Chichen yeah. Itza is everywhere. It's very identifiable. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I knew that Chichen Itza was made in, you know, the last couple thousand years. I didn't exactly know when. Mm-hmm. Uh, but knowing that it's only about uh, in the context of, you know, monumental architecture from civilizations we know well, it's, I mean, it's only like 1,200 years. Yeah. Yeah. And it practically looks brand new when you go there. I got to say, compared to other things. So actually, that's interesting you say that because you should see some of the pictures from the 1800s. It is well documented by like your early gentleman archaeologists in the 1800s because there's tons of photographs and like the whole thing is covered in, in vegetation, like fully covered in vegetation. It looks like a step period green mountain. <laughs> It, so to give you a little bit of background here, Chichen Itza is in the state of Yucatan in Mexico, and it's a large pre-Hispanic city. It was occupied from the late classic period to the early post-classic period. <laughs> there we go again with those with those oh dates. <laughs> and it sort of started rising to power in the in around 600, and it had really established itself as like the new sort of regional center and you know, by the 800s. And that's why people started moving there when the other cities were sort of falling apart further south. And then it was occupied consistently, we know for sure, until the 1100s. But I did read that when the conquistadors arrived, there were people living in the area. Now, whether they were occupying the actual structures there in and around the temple itself is unclear, or if it was just a nearby settlement, However, there were definitely people in the area and it's, I think, reasonable to assume that they were still using the temple for whatever purposes that particular group of people at that time wanted to use it for. Yeah. I mean, let's not forget that people are people, right? Yeah. They may have a local knowledge and lore of the area as a religious center and may fear some areas or have respect for some areas Mm -hmm. because of that. It's like, you know, I'm not... I don't know, uh, before Notre Dame burned down, if we were in France, I'm not Catholic. I wasn't there when it was built. I don't know anything, but I know enough to know that this is a a massive religious center for a large group of people and, you know, respect it when you go by. Mm-hmm. If, if, if that whole area had been abandoned and that cathedral was still sitting there, it's not like we'd turn it into a coffee shop. Well, we might, but, <laughs> you know, maybe a library or something. I mean, it probably would, would still be in use, especially in a place like this yeah. where it's not like those huge monumental structures were everywhere on the landscape. Right. You know, this one was pretty significant and unique. So yeah. if there were indigenous people living in that area, I'm sure that they were doing something with the temple, so, but it is unclear with the accounts of the the times of the people that were there. Yeah. I would say probably one of two things would keep people from living in these already built structures because Living is hard, right? Mm-hmm. So why wouldn't you live in these structures or around these structures and continue to use them, even though the center of power may have collapsed and nobody's really running it anymore? But one of the two reasons would be, A, that religious reference, knowing mm-hmm. that, hey, this is something important from the past. I probably shouldn't be here. It's kind of like bad juju. I don't want to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, lots of crazy things happen here. And also, you know, once it's, if people do leave for a little while, it doesn't take the jungle long to come back. Oh, for sure. And it would take a long time and a lot of maintenance to keep it beaten back. And if you don't yeah. have a, you know, a group and staff of people keeping up on that, the jungle's just going to take over. I'm telling you, we'll have to put a photo in the show notes, but like <laughs> furry green step pyramids, that's what they look like yeah. in the pictures yeah. from the 1800s. Or it's crazy. Well, and that's why it's been so hard to find stuff down in the, in the Yucatan and, and just like Mexico and Central America that are, you know, 
these these huge cities basically mm-hmm. and people just wandered up and, and like bumped into them basically yeah. because they didn't even know they were there and that's why things like lidar light detection and ranging it's you know usually aircraft mounted machine that can basically see through vegetation essentially by the way that it bounces light around and it can discern shapes beneath the vegetation that you wouldn't normally see. Right, right. Shapes in the landform. And also, of course, rock is basically landform that we have altered. So mm-hmm. uh, shapes like that. And that's how you can see some of this stuff. And a lot of people have found whole things like this mm-hmm. just from doing LIDAR surveys. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, as far as like the early excavations at Chichen Itza. Mm-hmm. So, of course, Americans have their hands in things as we do. <laughs> yeah. And there was an American ambassador to the Yucatan state specifically. His name was Edward Herbert Thompson in the 1800s. And he actually purchased Chichen Itza and all of the land around it sometime in the 18, late 1800s. Yeah, who did he buy that from? Unclear. I don't know. <laughs> like, who had the authority to sell it? <laughs> I don't know. It's actually interesting you say that because he did that. He excavated a lot of the temple area and a lot of the outlying buildings he did a lot of excavation don't know how well those excavations were done i Mm -hmm. didn't deep dive that and the other thing he did was in the 1900s like the early 1900s he dredged the cenote the main cenote there Mm -hmm. so cenote sagrado is the big cenote the biggest cenote on the property Mm -hmm. and edward herbert thompson dredged it to see what kind of artifacts he could find in it and he did he found like some jade stuff and some obsidian and a bunch of things and also human remains. And the Mexican government made a claim at one point that he stole all those artifacts that he found. Mm. And I guess it went through a court system, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, they decided that he didn't steal them because he had purchased the land and they gave it back to him. But anyway, it was a whole drama. And eventually he ended up selling the land to somebody who's actually Mexican and now it's, of course, in the hands of the Mexican government and it's a UNESCO heritage site. So... Mm -hmm. But an interesting beginning with a American gentleman archaeologist going in and just excavating and seeing what kind of treasure yeah. he could find. Yeah. <laughs> treasure hunting. Indiana Jones story right there. Yeah, cenotes are crazy. There's thousands of them on the Yucatan Peninsula. Yeah. And all over the place. And basically, they're just, they're openings to, I mean, to- we have we have aquifers all over this, all over the United States as well. And a lot of places have aquifers where there's water. And it's basically where the water table is. You know, there's water seeped into the upper crust of the earth all over the planet. Mm -hmm. In a place where you're largely at sea level the whole time, you have a lot of water that seeps in through the limestone. In fact, when we worked in in the site that we met on in Miami, Florida, Mm -hmm. we were in a place that we called the well. And it was a place and a source of fresh water for, you know, prehistoric peoples, but also the early Spanish that were there. Mm -hmm. Because... The, the brackish water of the Miami River was right next door, and then the intercoastal waterway was not that far away, but that was all salty. You couldn't drink that, and that water would filter through the limestone and then become drinkable as it filtered through the limestone to filter out all the salt. Yep. Well, these cenotes are freshwater cenotes. They're all connected underneath through networks of waterways. The closer you get to the, to the ocean or the gulf, depending on where you're at, it, it becomes saltier uh, mm-hmm. because it's not filled. Yeah. Yeah. They're basically just like sinkholes yeah. in, in the, on the surface that go down to the water table and they are the main source of water across that area of Mexico. And it's part of the reason why it was such an easy area for the Maya to, to settle and create monumental architecture because they had water just so easily accessible right there. Mm-hmm. So there's at least four cenotes in the immediate vicinity of the ruins. And there's probably many more that we don't know about. And there's actually, this is really interesting. And our guide did tell us about this when we were walking around Mm. the site is that there's a like hidden cenote or a covered or buried. I don't know if that's the right word. Well, they're all underground. Yeah. It just doesn't have an opening. Yeah. But I guess they think that the Mayan people knew about this cenote because it's underneath the, the main pyramid, the pyramid of Kokokan. And they just discovered it in 2015 that it was even there. Yeah, so. I mean, of course, we don't have a deep knowledge of this. And we don't know what they were thinking when they put this temple there. Or this entire this entire settlement, really. Mm-hmm. That being said, 
there are thousands of cenotes. Like yeah. you'd have to try hard not to put a temple yeah. over a cenote. Yeah. So it could have been a total accident. Yeah. Did they know it was way down there? Maybe, yeah. maybe not. But what's the difference? Yeah. You know what I mean? He made it sound like it was this, this big, uh, this big deal that oh, you know, they had more knowledge of the surrounding area, and they did. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. There's a, every chance that they possibly knew about it, right? Mm-hmm. But what would benefit them from putting a massive stone structure over a thin limestone crust that could collapse <laughs> into the water? I mean, I kind of would have wanted to put one somewhere where there wasn't a cenote yeah. underneath there. Yeah. You know, and I wonder if they're called cenotes when they don't have an opening, if it's just like an underground aquifer, but becomes a cenote when, it when it's got the turns opening. Into a sinkhole. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. I don't know about the geology of that. Probably if we knew what the word cenote meant in <laughs> yeah. Spanish. I don't know. I didn't, yeah. I didn't look that up. Yeah. I just know it means, well, it means sinkhole, I think, but yeah. yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah. But getting back to like the structures themselves at Chichen Itza, it is a complex of structures. We've kind of hinted at here. There's the largest one, which is the one that you see in all the images. It's the one that you and I posted mm-hmm. on Instagram when we were there. It's the step pyramid of Kokokan. And Kokokan is a, uh, a snake God, like a feathered snake God. And on the pyramid itself, down near the base, you, there's like the head of a snake. And this is where you also get the shadows across the side of the pyramid, create like a a ridged image that looks like the snake body, like flowing mm-hmm. down the side of the, of the structure at the equinoxes. And then one interesting thing to note about that is everybody wants to tell you that this only happens on the equinox, but just keep in mind that the sun will be in the position to create this snake image for several weeks on either side of the yeah. equinoxes and the pretty low resolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, yes, it is cool that they did build this in a specific way to create that and make that happen. But like, I don't really think they were using it as a way to know when the exact dates of the equinox were and stuff like that. I mean, if you've ever played Minecraft, it's kind of like an intentional 8-bit video game. And <laughs> like pretty much all the Mayan structures are like 8-bit Minecraft structures. <laughs> yeah, they kind of are with yeah. that geometric like shape. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're not very high resolution. Yeah. They're a little bit fuzzy when you yeah. look at them like that. Yeah. I, I don't know if we know exactly for sure. There's a lot of things that seem to line up with this pyramid. Mm-hmm. But even if they really, truly, intentionally did that it wouldn't have been exact like you said no it's just two with shadows and with the pyramid and yeah. the, the sun and i mean you would have had to have had something that was i don't know way more exacting even like early sundials you make a sundial now today it's not going to be super it's not exact. perfect you're going to know what hour it is maybe yeah. what 10 or 15 minute chunk of time it is but depending on the thickness of your your rod in the middle and the resolution of your clock around the edge you know, that's going to determine what exact time it is, Yeah. you know, and then you have to know exact time of day and there's just so yeah. many factors in it. So, and I don't mean to like, to say that they weren't like super smart and intelligent with their oh, knowledge of yeah. the sun and the way it moved and stuff like that. They clearly were, but I almost feel like it does a disservice to their knowledge to try to say that they built this temple to let them know when the equinox was please these people knew when the equinox they didn't need some shadow on a temple to tell them when the equinox is happening like yeah, they they definitely knew when that was going on exactly so. it's probably more like they built it to demonstrate their knowledge of when the equinox is yeah. to the people around it because yeah you know religion for a really long time and religion has always been tied to like monarchy and power and things mm-hmm. like that they get their power from having knowledge of astronomical events. Yeah, and you know? displaying it. And displaying that yeah. power. Because mm-hmm. the average person's like, how did they know? You know, because yeah. they don't study that. Yeah. They, don't, they don't have that knowledge and that power. And so by building this thing that says, look at this magic snake we made on this certain day of the year, <laughs> that is pretty crazy yeah. for people that don't understand it. Yeah, that's true. It probably was yeah. a way to like just show, just a, a power show, a power yeah. Power display. Of the I, power display. I don't think we could ever prove this, but I have no doubt that when societies start to collapse, it's when people start to figure that kind of stuff out. And the <laughs> Maybe. power center collapses and everybody <laughs> just kind of fades into the jungle because now they all have the same knowledge. Yeah. Somebody figures it out, tells everybody else and said, these guys are all a sham. They're just humans mm-hmm. that did a thing and they're keeping this from us. Mm-hmm. And then when that starts to happen, you have revolution and collapse. Mm-hmm. So... So in addition to the Kukulkan temple, we have also the temple of the warriors, the great ball court. There's a skull platform and many, many more structures. And I would say, given our experience there, you will spend no time learning about those other things. (laughs) (laughs) 
if like, you're on a tour. If you're on a tour like we were, and maybe we can get into how our tour experience was specifically. Yeah, in the next here. segment. Yeah, but I didn't feel like we got to to talk about any of those other structures, really. We spent a lot of time looking at the main period and then sort of quickly moved through everything else. Mm-hmm. So now Chichen Itza is a little bit interesting because it is a mix of different architectural styles. And we mentioned in the previous segment that was a little bit because we had people moving from uh, Belize and Guatemala up north as those centers of power had collapsed in the south. They moved north and they brought these different architectural styles with them and it became this mix. But additionally, we also have some central Mexico styles that sort of come into play. And there's a city called Teotihuacan, which is over by Mexico City in central Mexico. And it was at this time a really, really large complex area they also had large complex temples and stuff going on over there you know what they weren't Hmm. mayan yeah (laughs) they were not mayan and i think this is something that gets overlooked a lot because everybody's heard you know a lot of people have heard of teotihuacan and i just kind of assumed oh it was either mayan is aztec it was one of those because those are the two main ones nope Mm -hmm. they were not they were their origins are something that are still debated and are a little bit unknown yeah when the power collapsed in that area, they sort of became like the Olmec people probably. Hmm. But anyway, so there's some influence from them and they might've been putting pressure on the Maya cities in the area. And that might've been why some of the cities collapsed and people moved to Chichen Itza. So. All right. Well, we'll end this segment there. And on the other side, we'll talk about some more of the things that we saw there, a little bit of the history and maybe a little bit about the tour itself. Uh, We'll dive a little more specifically into the tour and what that was like in case as a lot of Americans do, you go down to Cancun and you want to come and visit. Uh, yeah, you should Itza. definitely know what you're getting into with those. Yeah. So we'll be back in a second with our final segment to talk about that. You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun t-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our T Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo, saucy. Zaxby's. People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match. With Indeed. The hiring process can be slow and overwhelming. Simplify hiring with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. That's Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. Terms and conditions apply. All right. Welcome back to episode 118 of the Archaeology Show. And we're talking about our trip to Chichen Itza. And I do have to mention, too, like a noise started between segments on this like <laughs> hotel room apartment thing that we're in. Yeah. And I don't know if I can remove it all and make it still sound good. So there it is. Yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. The joys of podcasting from pretty much anywhere in the world. Yeah. I, you know, we should like really investigate a mobile studio somehow. Well, this is our mobile studio. We have microphones. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's but true. You can have a, like a mobile wraparound sound booth to take with you. That would be... I can't fit that in my backpack. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But it would be kind of cool if we could. Yeah. You know what else is not mobile? Big stone pyramids. (laughs) What? (laughs) (laughs) So we're talking about our experiences at Chichen Itza in the Yucatan Peninsula. And it was, again, uh, quite the experience. Yeah. So we did book the trip through our resort and... We felt safer doing it that way because Mexico is another country and we didn't know like what 
travel around the country would be like and stuff like that. So yeah, and it was specifically booked through a company called Cancun Tours. Oh, and okay. I actually reviewed them on TripAdvisor because I thought while I would have liked a lot more time in Chichen Itza. I thought the entire day, which we'll mention briefly since this is not a podcast about that, but it's more about Chichen Itza, but it was actually kind of like a whole history day, which was kind of nice. But yeah. I thought they did overall a really good job, like wrangling us all together and taking us different places and having us experience like four unique experiences yeah. in the course of a single day. I agree, but... It felt a little bit too... Too much. Too rushed. Yeah. So here, here's our day. Let me just lay it out for you so you can know what you're getting into if you book one of these tours because it seems like they are all very similar. So we had to get up and leave the hotel super early at like 7 a.m. and Which is super early like resort time. Well, yeah. I mean, you probably had some drinks tonight before. Let's, let's not lie. So, you mean the anyway. entire day before? <laughs> right. So you got to be up and, and ready to go really early. 7 a.m. They pick you up in one of their vans. Which we almost missed for, he, because of their fault. It was their fault. It's fine. <laughs> Whatever. We got on the van. And um, the first stop was to like a Mayan village. But it took like, what, three hours to get there? It was a long, uh, it it was took long a couple trip. hours to get there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for so sure. they kind of left us alone for the morning part of the ride. And we just sort of like chilled and had time to read or do whatever in the van. Yeah. But we got to this Mayan village and right before we got there, we got a whole lecture about how this is the only place that you can buy authentic Mayan goods and to never, ever, ever spend money on anything that you buy in Chichen Itza. And we were like, oh, wow, that's like super great. I'm totally into like supporting like true Mayan authentic artifacts, blah, blah, blah. Great. So we get there and like, it's like a hotel that has a store. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little village back there. Is there? Okay. Well, <laughs> the people, I think the people live in the area. This is just where they sell their stuff. Probably. So yeah. it did feel a little bit better because we bought a couple things and like, it did feel like we were supporting the people that actually lived in that area. Yeah. But it's, it's unclear because it could have been just like a tourist thing that they set up for these tours specifically. Right. They did feed us there though. We got lunch. It was a little bit early. It was probably food was good. And it was really good. Really, yeah. really good food. food so it was really good. So from there, yeah. Well, let's talk about that real quick, because if you're in archaeology and you're listening to this, you'll know all about obsidian. There were people that we were with that had never heard of obsidian before, which kind of blew me away. I mean, I'm sure there was a time when I didn't know about obsidian either, but I also grew up with a grandfather who was kind of a rock hound. So I kind of knew about obsidian from a small child. I for sure didn't know <laughs> anything about obsidian. Yeah. Like I probably learned about it in school or something, but I didn't understand like what it looked like in real life at all. Sure, sure. And so they had just a ton of, of really cool stuff. They did this whole presentation about their Mayan gods and the different shapes and things like that. And what these obsidian talisman, for a lack of a better word, will do like, oh, if you want to have great wealth, you buy this one and put it in your house. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And apparently hot rock massages. And I don't know. I've never had one of those, but apparently they're polished obsidian a lot of times. Oh, and these people think that the the obsidian like focuses energy and mm -hmm. whatever. It, you can decide about that if you want. But yeah. And here was my thing with this whole experience is that you didn't know what was like geared towards tourists spending money mm -hmm. and what was true, legit, like Mayan cultural Right. practices you know yeah, so stuff wasn't cheap either because this no, was a small mayan village now we bought no. these two uh obsidian discs that are really they look like coasters yeah the size of a coaster and, right? and they look like they're like super highly polished and really oh, shiny highly polished very probably the purest obsidian i've ever seen in my yeah, life really beautiful Just like no imperfections no banding no anything and the one reason i wanted to buy one i bought a plain one with no design on it was because you can hold it up to the sun and look directly at the sun through it because mm -hmm. it's such dark obsidian there's lighter more translucent obsidian that you can't do that with and i've never seen a big enough piece of obsidian to look at the sun yeah we often find like a projectile point or something like that and we hold it up to the sun to see the banding and yeah. you know, describe it, but it's never been big enough to just like block the entire sun. But right. this thing is probably four inches across and you can do that. And Rachel bought an identical one, but has like an etched in uh, pattern like on it. Swirly really pattern. Neat. Yeah. Now those were $50 a piece. Yeah. US, like 1400 Mexican dollars. Yeah. Pesos. <laughs> and so here's the thing, like our guide was over and over, like really hammering the point that this is the only place to get this authentic stuff yeah. and you wouldn't be able to buy it at Chichen Itza. And if you wanted to buy something like this, you really needed to do it at this shop. And 
okay, great. Like we'll, we'll comply with that. Like we did, we bought it there, but I definitely saw like tons and tons and tons of vendors at Chichen Itza itself selling the exact same thing. Yeah. Probably cheaper though. I didn't investigate prices too closely. So, yeah. So, you know, again, it's hard to know if like that first stop was just a tourist trap made to like funnel our money there instead of at Chichen Itza. I don't know, but here's what did happen though is when you enter. So the next stop was Chichen Itza, right? Mm -hmm. After lunch and after this Mayan village, which was really a hotel, a resort, a resort, sure. (laughs) With a pool and everything. So it looked real fancy. We, we pull up to Chichen Itza. It's really packed, like super packed. And our guide and apparently that's not very packed. It looked packed to us, but it's not very packed given the times right now. When we were ready to get in, we got right in. Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah. So the guide, he hammered home a couple things again. Like they're very specific about making sure that we knew certain things. And this, the one at this place was that they only had 90 minutes for the tour. 90 minutes for the tour. No more, no less. We had to be out after 90 minutes. And like, like they were somehow starting a clock. Well, I don't know about you, but I didn't notice anybody paying any attention to what our tickets said when we went in or how long we were there or who was actually keeping track of this 90 minute clock. Yeah. Well, like I said in a previous segment, nobody took our ticket or noted that we even walked out the front door. No. So, so so here's the thing. And this is probably going to happen if you do one of these tours. And honestly, I felt safer doing this tour. I'm not sure I would do it differently anyway, because I don't speak Spanish very well. And like, it just, it felt easier, but 90 minutes is not enough time in Chichen Itza. If you're an archeologist like us and you want to like roam around and look at all of the different structures and all the different temples and everything and take all the pictures and do the things that you want to do. 90 minutes is not enough time because this place is huge and sprawling and yeah. Yeah. And the, the other big thing is they, I don't want to say required, but basically required us to stay with them during the tour. Yeah. There was another couple that was with us that we actually talked to quite a bit and the woman, she just wasn't having it. She they was hung, not into it. It was so funny. Like 30 <laughs> minutes, And then at some point when he was rambling on, she's like, listen, can we just go? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, don't miss the bus. You better be back at the front. Yeah. And they, they hooked up with us a little bit later, but they yeah. went off and did their own thing. And I don't know, without having been prepared prior to with like literature and things to know what I'm looking at, I appreciated the first time going through, regardless of whether or not his information was 100% accurate or current, mm-hmm. I appreciated having the information and having the person to take us around this first pass. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Having somebody who knows what they're looking at is really nice. I just wish we could have slowed down the pace. I, like we spent a lot of time at the main temple, which is great because that is the most spectacular part of it. Mm-hmm. But we really just like blew through all of the other structures. And there's like eight, ten other things to see there. There's a lot of stuff to see. There. A lot. And probably other things that we didn't even stop, stop by at all. So that was my only complaint is I would have liked more time to just roam. I wish we could have been sent off on our own for half an hour, an hour maybe, and then meet back up at a certain time. That would have been more my speed. Right. I think two hours uh, or two and a half hours would have been great to just kind of detail what you just said. Basically do the tour with him, walk around, see stuff, and then, you know, go do our own thing. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And I think we speculated that it's possible that they just didn't have time Because this was only stop two of four for this tour. Yes. So it might be that this 90 minute hard stop deadline that that they gave us was because that was the allotted time before we had to get to the next thing. Right. So. So I don't know. Are we done kind of talking about Chichen Itza? Because because the rest of the tour was also somewhat historical and probably interesting to people who are fans of history and archaeology. I kind of want to talk about the rest of it. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think we kind of covered everything for Chichen Itza. We, there's not really much else to say. I definitely recommend if you're going to Cancun to visit it for sure. And maybe if you are like us and want to get more archaeology and less of the other stuff, although the other stuff is neat, but if you want more Mm -hmm. archaeology, maybe look into a tour that spends all day at the site rather than one of the ones like we did where you hop around to different things. Right. But it's totally up to you because I feel like the rest of it was worth it for us as well. Yeah. And so let's talk about the rest of this because Mm -hmm. the next thing that we did was only like 30 minutes from Chichen Itza. And as we mentioned in a previous segment, there are 
cenotes everywhere, which yeah. are basically sinkholes where you can access fresh water. Yeah. Some of these are incredibly deep. Some of them have cave structures underwater. Some of them have cave structures above water where you can go in. Uh, we saw pictures. There were some tours you could do that were specific cenote tours where you're wearing a life jacket and you're literally inside of a cave floating around this yeah. thing, which I... I don't know how that would have been. Uh, oh, I'm like so into that. I know. But <laughs> I think I would have done it for sure. But I don't know how it would have been. Let's yeah. just put it that way. But we we didn't do that kind. <laughs> no, we. I mean, we did the one that was just like on this tour, right? So we didn't know what to expect. But again, they took us to this kind of tourist hub that was like centered around the cenote, but had like a bar and a restaurant and, a, restaurant and, and like yeah. a gift shop and a bunch of other stuff. And it was really kind of tourist heavy. But that being said, because it was like that, they really did everything, I think, really well for, again, a first experience doing yeah. this stuff. When I go to someplace, my first experience, I wouldn't mind it being heavily guided yeah. just so I can know. Like what to expect. Yeah, what yeah. to do there. So you had to get a life jacket. They had really good, um, your typical like water skiing style life jackets uh, in lots of mm-hmm. sizes, a changing room outside, showers where you could rinse off because they don't want your sunscreen and all that other chemicals into the cenote, which is cool because mm-hmm. cenotes, the underground aquifers, I mean, it's the source of water for yeah. like, all over the peninsula. So, And then you have to go down these steps that are real slippery. They're stone and, and then wood and yeah. steep and you got to be real careful. And you go all the way down these steps. I think they said it was like 160 steps or something like yep. that, way down to the water level. And you've got traffic going in both directions. You oh, know what it yeah. reminded me of? It reminded me of the steps to some of the waterfalls in Yosemite. Exactly. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. With Very much like people. that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you're trying to go up and down. It's peak time, and you're trying to get to this, like you're trying to do this hike. Yeah. I say hike in like air quotes because <laughs> some of those waterfall views, they're right off of like a main yeah. road in Yosemite, and it's just loaded with people that don't want to go. And like farther. somebody wears old navy flip flops and like oh can't God. handle the steps. Yeah. It's like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget one of those little, little aside where we had to go through all that to continue the hike to like the upper falls, yeah. which was a much more strenuous hike. And there was nobody up there. Yeah. Yeah. Which again, yeah. do the, do the thing that other people don't yeah. do. Cause it's way better anyway. So anyway, getting down there was cool. You could jump off into the cenote. I've got a thing with my ear that happened back in like high school and I can't really jump into water without blowing my head up. Mm-hmm. So I didn't do that. And we kind of like walked down the steps. But once you're in the cenote, it's huge. They've got these ropes that you can kind of like hold on to. There's no real current, but if you want to just kind of like chill and hold on to one of the yeah. ropes and not move around, you can do that. The water was very refreshing for the 90 plus degrees it was yeah. down there. There was a waterfall at one point of it. Like there's yeah. water coming down the top across like... What's the mathematical term for like the drip edge? Well, like it, oh. the cenote was a circle, and there was like a waterfall. Like a tangent. Like, yeah, 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 like a tangent across one part of it. It was it was so cool. So we swam under that a little bit. Yeah, it was it was just quite a neat experience for some something that you can't. I've never heard of anyway in the United States. So I definitely recommend checking out a cenote if you go to Cancun. It was really cool. Yeah, and, and we were in there for I think we had like an hour. Yeah, uh, at this place and. We made it out right as we were getting into the bus. We did. Because we spent probably, it didn't feel like it, but we must have spent 30 to 35 minutes like just floating in the sit we, we must have. <laughs> we had our cameras out and, and oh, we should definitely, we haven't created a video for this yet, but we will at some point and we'll, yeah. we'll backlink it to this episode so you guys can watch our video about it because it was so cool. We recorded some social media type stuff too, but we did yeah. it all on the GoPro yeah. and not on our phone. So it's kind of locked into the GoPro right yeah, now. Yeah, we haven't downloaded yeah. and all that fun so, stuff. So we'll get there. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that was all super cool. And when we left the cenote, again, we didn't hang out. We didn't go to the, I mean, if you didn't want to swim, you could like get a drink or something, I guess. But we didn't do any of that. Yep. And the next stop was a, what they said was like a typical Mexican town, which I always forget the name of, Valle Valle Donde or Valle de Day or something. Very, it starts with a V. It was a, it was one of, a more difficult Spanish word, yeah. and I can't remember what it was either. But my takeaways from that were it's a typical, like they said, it's a typical Mexican town. Yep. And that one cool thing that I didn't know about, there's a Catholic church there. Oh, yeah, that was a good story. <laughs> that apparently like 200 years ago or something, somebody was murdered like in the church. Right. And then the Rome, uh, you know, the Vatican, basically, they shut that church down and said, nope, you can't have a church anymore. Yeah, it's been desecrated. Years, you can't use it right. anymore. And a few yeah. years later, and I think they demolished it. Uh, they demolished oh, the old did church. They? They yeah, because full on got rid of it. Okay. Because when a new, I don't know, new priest or whatever came in and said, "I want to build another church here because this town needs a church," mm-hmm. the Vatican's like, "Yeah, great, but 
because this ground had somebody killed on it uh, in the church, your church will now face north and not face east. Like apparently Catholic churches always did in the past. I don't know if they still do, but I don't know. You'd think I would know that, but I don't know. You know, we're in Philadelphia right now. How can you make it face east? But well, I suppose you pick your, if it's that important, you pick your property so that it it works. But yeah. Yeah. But apparently it faces north because it can no longer face east because it lives in sin. (laughs) But there you go. Well, and with this, the way Mexican towns are set up. And, and I think this is true across Central South America and probably in Europe too, because a couple of places I went in Peru looked exactly like this when we went, but it's like a big square in the middle. There's usually kind of a park atmosphere with benches and trees and grass and all that kind of stuff, a place for people to go and relax, walk their dogs, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So they had that. And then there's all the buildings sort of lining the edge of the square. And the church was one of them. And there, there just was a bunch of stuff there. It's a bunch of restaurants on one side, a lot of buildings. We went and got some elote, the street corn, which was super yummy. Delicious. Yeah, there's churros if you wanted to do it. So anyway, we had about half an hour there to just kind of walk around, experience the center square of the town. And I enjoyed that from a cultural perspective because, first of all, it reminded me of going to Peru. So I saw the similarities and which is, it's a Spanish influence, right? So yeah. like, I totally could see why they had that. And it was just a cool experience to see like, you know, just a normal town where normal people live. And mm-hmm. it wasn't, I didn't feel like it was heavy, heavily touristy. There was a couple other people around like us, but it wasn't crazy. So that was a cool yeah. end to our trip. Yeah. One final note on that. They were mentioning as we came in that a lot of the older buildings which were most of them were older buildings, including the church, were built from essentially Mayan ruins. Oh, yeah. They yeah. repurposed the bricks because, yeah. you know, why not? Because there's the <laughs> or not bricks, but stones. Stones, yeah. yeah. The place is littered with Mayan ruins, right? Yeah. So back in the day when people were building towns, they yeah. would just like dismantle these things yeah. and bring them over and, and use them in construction. So. Yeah. Again, reminding me of Peru because you see that fusion of architecture down there so much, particularly yeah. in Cusco, which is near where Machu Picchu is. So right. anyway, super interesting. <laughs> yeah. So if you're ever down in the area, remember Cancun is not in the Yucatan Peninsula. It's in the Quintana Roo uh, district. or what? Oh, it's on the Yucatan Peninsula, but the, yeah. the, like, the state states is Quintana yeah. Roo. Yeah. And then you go over to Yucatan. Which is where Chichen Itza is. Which is where Chichen Itza And it's like a solid three-hour drive. So that's why this was a full 12-hour day is because we had three hours of driving on either end of it. Plus like two hours of driving in the middle of it. Yeah. There was a lot of driving. There was a lot of driving. Yeah, that's why it was a really long day. So, (laughs) And we had a bus transfer at the beginning and the end because we kind of picked up people. But And if you're tall, watch out like you. Oh my God, my feet, my legs were in the seats. My knees were like the entire time. Yeah, they're not made for tall people. (laughs) At least the vans, every every vehicle we got in was heavily air conditioned. Yes. Yeah. Chichen Itza is going to be super hot too. It was super windy on the whole peninsula that entire week. Mm-hmm. So that was great for us. But if it's not, it's wildly exposed and super hot. Yes. But the wind really kept it down. So yes. Yeah. But it's a spectacular archaeological site. It's been well preserved yeah. and it's definitely worth seeing. Yeah, absolutely. So check it out. Check out our show notes and we'll see you next time. Adios. Thanks for listening to The Archaeology Show. Feel free to comment and view the show notes on the website at www.archpodnet.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ArcPodNet. Music for this show is called I Wish You Would Look from the band Sea Hero. Again, thanks for listening and have an awesome day. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.